All right, no, we can, uh, we're going to stand and pray. Thank you for everybody coming today. Uh, at least like they got the chair situation solved. <laughs> the mysterious chair bandit <laughs> coughed up the rest of these chairs. Um, we're just going to start in prayer real quick. Uh, just cover, cover everything in prayer. Uh, let's look to our Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be alive, Lord Jesus, allowing us to be here with our families, um, to come and uh, not just worship you, Lord, um, uh, in, 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 in word, but also in uh, deed and action. Uh, we just ask, Lord Jesus, that anything we said that are done that was against your will, Lord, please forgive us, Lord. We just ask that we have clarity in mind today, Lord, that you speak through your word, Lord Jesus, so that it can edify us, encourage us, Lord, to live the way that you called us to live, Lord. We thank you again, and we just ask that you bless this word, and, um, and we just open up our, our hearts and our ears to really receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, turn the music down just for a second. So everybody made it in. Amen. It was probably just as rough to get here <laughs> for all of us to yeah, the travel. Um, we are, if anybody is caught up, we've been talking about, um, so just to kind of update for some of us, they know, and Daniel and some of the other folks you guys met, uh, we've been going over the Holy Spirit. Right. Um, I'm not really a, a series type of guy, but because I'm led by the Holy Spirit, whatever he wants to talk about, that's what we talk about. But our discipleship meetings um, are, are really more of a they're Bible studies. Uh, we don't like to call them discovery groups, but they are discovery groups because there is some interaction. But uh, this is continuing on with with uh, what the topic we were speaking about. And we went over certain subjects first. Uh, if you guys go onto the YouTubes, I have them all set. But the first part is, you know, what's a disciple, right? And if you guys look up, that word, simply put, means to not just follow the one that, you know, is your teacher, right? Like an apprentice, like... A, a contractor, <laughs> it's impossible for a trade in construction to not have an actual, you know, apprentice and teacher, you know? Even if you're a baker, you're going to have to have someone show you how to bake. You just don't go in the kitchen and just start whipping up stuff and you're like, ta-da, all right, I'm ready to open up a bake shop. It doesn't work like that. You have to learn from someone. And Jesus said to go make disciples, not just believers, right? We got a lot of people... They believe in Jesus, right? They believe he existed, that he was a thing. I heard the other day a lady was telling me, hey, Jesus is a guru. And I was like, no, Jesus is God in the flesh. Like we have two different Jesuses, right? So it's a big difference when you're looking at Christ as the son of God on earth and says, hey, I'm saving humanity, right, by my precious blood. And I'm going to give humanity an opportunity to reconcile uh, you know, our, our big issue, which is sin. So this is a part of, a, like we sp spoke about, everything is foundation, right? You cannot build properly without the foundation being laid. And our foundation is Christ. So we start with discipleship, okay? That was like our, our first thing. Um, it's basically discipleship, not, not converts, okay? Kind of getting out of the, the convert mindset, right? Where everything has to be like, this particular process, and then boom, you're out the oven. When God has taken us through our entire lives, it's called, there's three types. I, I, I'll, I'll just say this here so you guys get it. I call it three types of salvation. And you may have seen this. Some people teach this way. But there's justification. And like I said, the other people, I, I'm not fully... What do you call, I don't I have like chicken scratch over here. <laughs> Justification, right? And there's, uh, you want me to write for you? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, saint, sanctification, all right? Okay, and then we got uh, glorification, okay? All right. So basically, when someone becomes born again, what are they really justified? The Bible says the just shall what? Walk by faith, Amen. We're justified by our faith, our trust and obedience in Christ Jesus. 
His grace. Amen? Not our grace. We don't have any. Amen? There's nothing to offer. There's no blood that we can shed. You know, so some of this is redundant, but we need to really clearly break this down when people understand we're saved by grace through faith. Through faith in who? Christ Jesus, right? But that is being faithful. That's an expectation. There's a response. There's a uh, faithfulness. There's a, hey, I am being obedient till the end. This is the process in which, right? By, by grace through faith. You know what the Bible says about faith? Hebrews says it is impossible to please God without what? Faith. You want to know why? Well, first thing, God says it's why. <laughs> but the real reason why is because the Bible says anyone that comes to God must believe that he is God. And he's a rewarder for those that diligently seek him. That means you desperately push through situations and you're saying, I'm not coming to God. Like we complain about so many things in life. And we put these little prayers up and not realizing you're talking to the God of the universe. He's bigger than your water bill. He's bigger than your light bill. Amen. He's bigger than our rent, our mortgage, whatever, all these things that we get so caught up in. And he's trying to get us out of that mentality of, hey, we walk by faith, not by sight. We are not so consumed about what we're seeing. We understand that the Bible says that faith is a substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen. And here's the thing. That beginning part says now faith. Not later on faith. Right now. Right now is the time to have the faith in God that you're supposed to operate in. You're supposed to pull on to God and say, God, I know who you really are. You are God. And you are a rewarder of someone like me that diligently seeks you in everything. And so when God is looking for that type of faith, boom. Matches it, he justifies us. Okay? He makes us right. Now, sanctification is where that's the work of the Holy Spirit, which we've been covering. Okay? In the Holy Spirit, the Bible says he is the paraclete, he's the helper. That's just a Greek word, paraclete, okay? Because I know people say, para what? Para who? Right? Para, right? Like when you hear the term paranormal, right? Para. Right. Ghost. Really. Holy Ghost. OK. I don't want to be all old school with y'all, but, you know, that's how they really used to say it. You could tell the, what denomination you're talking to. When they say it's the Holy Spirit. Right. And then you could tell another good. Denomination, that's the Holy Ghost. Right. You know, it's the difference. Who are you talking to? Are you talking to some Southern, some Pentecostal or you know what I mean? Preachers like that. They gonna say, what you talking about? The Holy Ghost. Right. So I know what circles we're talking about when, we, when they say certain things. But Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, paraclete, you know, that's the theologian, paraclete, right? So, but basically it's the helper. The Holy Spirit helps and leads us and guides his truth. The Holy Spirit is God's spirit, okay? There's no question about that, right? And we're going to go over more details, but I feel in the spirit that we need to understand that this is the part that most of us get really caught up in sanctification to be sanctified to be sanctified really just means to be set apart or to be made y'all see that word keyword made holy we talk about this a lot holiness for us or holiness according to the scriptures and i'm just going to call it out is not legalism okay We've known, and I've been on both sides of the spectrum. I've shown this before. I've been literally, you got literally moderate, you know, I don't even want to call it, I'm not going to call it gummy bear, but I'm just going to say, you know, kind of sweet tea Christianity, right? Like that's a little in between, you know, whatever, right? You got the in-betweens, you got the, you know, something on a song, hill, whatever type stuff. And then you got the super legalistic, you can't wear open toe shoes, nothing, right? And then you got, you know, the extra progressive, you know, come as you are, stay as you are kind of situation over here, right? There's a broad spectrum. You know what they're missing? This is what we call 
get this right here. You're missing discipleship. Right? Where, where legalism is all about, I wear these things, and this outward expression of things will tell me I'm holy. Eh, wrong! That's as close as, that's almost more, that's, that's big time Pharisees. That's big time, you know? Because they were literally criticizing Jesus. They're saying, hey, look at your disciples. They didn't wash their hands right before they eat. And he was looking at them like, you guys keep, by the way, that, that HVAC system is possessed. We're going to rebuke it later on today. But <laughs> it's a little inside joke. Yeah. Nobody talks about Isaiah Green. Amen. But no, um, they were being criticized for not washing their hands before they ate, right? And we know, we always say that, you know, wash your hands before you eat, all that stuff. Jesus was basically telling them, look, you guys are making these traditions actually, actually like they're coming from God. He said, these are man-made traditions. He said, we develop these things. And then he says, you know, the real thing that actually defiles a person, the real thing that makes someone wicked, it's not what you're eating. <laughs> He said, it's actually what's coming out of your mouth. It's what you're speaking. Because that's where all wicked imaginations come from where? The heart. Where people say, follow your heart. No, don't do that. Right? Because your heart is wicked. Amen. Thank you. I know I got to be all old school, swipe and stuff. But we got this thing going on here. And discipleship is like lost. Discipleship in most people's mind is, I just got a leader. And then there's a follower. When true, true, um, true discipleship, according to the word of God, is whatever taught, whatever Christ taught, the Bible says in Matthew 28, Luke 10, and so forth, Christ commanded the disciples who eventually became apostles, and eventually they broke that down to the rest of the church. They carried on the legacy and the teachings of Jesus. Right. And we find all of that. And you guys want to hold that into it. But we find all that in this scripture, uh, Hebrews six. OK, so if you guys want to know what the foundationary teachings of Christ are, they're all in here. OK, this is what I always try to tell people. Do not disconnect the Gospels from the epistles and from the book of Acts. Don't do that. See, that's what copy, copy, paste Christianity does. That's what. Cessationists do. That's what reformation, like people that don't really understand the cohesiveness of scripture. They, and they don't have this revelation that Jesus was just saying, carry on and amplify what I was saying, what I was doing here. And the apostles carried that out and they kept carrying it out. But this process of sanctification is now for every disciple a person that's born again, born, born of the water and the spirit, not just a confessing Christian. Because remember, even Jesus said, he said, out of their lips, they what? You said it the other day to me. He said, out of their lips, he said, they confess me, right? But their hearts are what? Far from me. Amen? Or like in Timothy, he says, some people having a form of godliness, right? But denying the what? Power, the Holy Spirit, to really help them change their lives. So they think they can live a set apart life and be made useful for God. That's what that's what discipleship is. Discipleship is not about you attaining some type of glory. You're giving God the glory out of your life now. Right. You're actually becoming more unified with your true identity, because according to the word of God, our real identity is in Christ because he created us before the foundation of the world to be shaped, to be conformed. I talked about this Sunday conformed, but I never got to open up what conformed means. I talk about reform, but conformed is even another. It's like a shaping, right? Anybody ever do pottery ever? OK, pottery. OK, amen. Oh, a few of us did pottery. I did pottery. None of y'all. OK, I don't know what wood, wood woodworking, whatever. But regardless, when you do that, you're spinning the wheel and all that other stuff. It's all nasty. But the reality is that you can shape that clay or whatever, that lump, whatever you're doing. And then eventually it's shaped, but it has to go through what? Kilt, right? It has to go through 
What, what's, what's the term? We have to go through the... Amen. Fire. Yes. <laughs> Why? Because that's the way it what stays its shape. It stays together. Amen. You keep it like that. That thing is <laughs> it's going to fold up on you. It's going to crack everything else. Not saying it doesn't. But what you guys don't realize, and I'm going to take it to another level spiritually. We're being shaped. We're being molded all throughout. The Bible says, think it not strange. The what? Think it not strange. The what? Fiery trials. Oh, that's cute. The fiery trials that come to what? Test your, Test your what? Faith. Faith. So what tests our faith? Trials. trials. Oh my goodness. Why are we talking about trials right now? <laughs> because God is saying, don't think it's strange. He said, don't go like, oh, what's happening? What's going on? God's like, I'm shaping you. I'm molding you. I'm perfecting you. I'm sanctifying you. I know sanctification is the process that we're like, oh, so being set apart from God means that God is getting. Do you know what God said about our faith? He said, your faith is so precious. It's like he compares it to gold being purified by the fire and gold. When it hits fire, the impurities get taken out of it. Hallelujah. So there's a process that we go through in life where we're actually truly being sanctified. That's why when I tell people, oh, you come into, you know, the Christian faith or you start being led by the spirit. I said, oh, yeah, you're on a I say you are now in true battlefield. You just didn't know it before before you were on the other side. And you were just like walking around like a prisoner of war. You didn't even understand. You're thinking you're having a good time, you know. But the reality is you're in a, you're in major warfare right now. But now as a Christian, we're trying to figure out why am I going through so much? Like just to live for God. Like everybody's ostracizing me. Like people are making me feel like this and that and the whole night. Well, yeah, I mean, you're going through a sanctification. You're literally going through a process where trials are testing where your faith really is in. Where is your faith really? When you have literally in your mind, no hope, right? When people, when you're almost dying on your deathbed or you lose everything, you, you over, over, like, I, like back in the day, we used to be uh, check systems after check systems uh, out of every single bank account. Like we used to try to go up and try to act like we somebody like uh, we're going to open up this bank account and they just look at us like they just want to give the biggest stick and get, get out of here. You know, we got every negative plus negative plus negative account <laughs> on the scene. You know, I remember having to go places and be like, back in the day, they used to allow it. You can like swipe like and then hit your account for like a dollar, you know, but you swipe up and try to put like a hundred dollars in your in your oh, gas yeah. tank. Oh, yeah. I was I try to get over the hill because that's when we was living in Bakersfield. I try to get over yesterday. Now, <laughs> no, I ain't like that. Oh, we way far from that. We're far from the tang now, all right? I remember the days. <laughs> we used to drink nothing but tang, right? Y'all don't even, even know. But, yeah, tang. Five dollar, look, five dollar Little Caesars was like our, that was our thing. That was our special night. We was dancing if we can get two. No, man, come on now. That's, that wasn't even around. Nobody had, we definitely had no blaze piece of money. But anyways, but we go through things, amen? We go through things because God is saying, look, you are being sanctified. Now, there's some things that we go through because of us, right? And there's some things we go because we have a target on our back. You understand? And God is allowing it because if you're really trusting in the Holy Spirit, he's going to lead you. Amen? Not you lead it. The Holy Spirit is not your genie of the lamp. All right? It's not the, oh, Holy Spirit, do this for me. No, that's not how it works. Holy Spirit is going to speak to you. Now, he speaks to people differently, but that's depending on how much time you spend with him. How much time do you spend with God? That's where intimacy and relationship becomes a priority. That's why I tell people, what are the two hardest things for most believers to do? Pray and read their word. And it's such the most generic, uh, uh, but like it's the most typical thing that's said all throughout, but almost Always avoid it. We are trying to. I, I know people that will read self-help books before they'll pick up their Bible. 
They'll read motivational or, you know, they'll get a gazillion Instagram quotes. Amen. And instead of opening up that Bible and say, what is the whole context of what I'm reading? What is this author really saying? Like, you know, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Oh, man, let's not talk about that one because that is used <laughs> so wrong. Right. Even Steph Curry. Yeah, I'm dropping names here. He got it on his shoe, right? And it says, you know, Philippians, what he called? Was it 4? 4, 4.13, yeah. And then he says, I can do all things. And he goes, you know, this is the whole thing when he makes a three-pointer, right? Yeah. It's like this. So anyways, I'm like, hey, but you know, the context of that was Paul was beaten, shipwrecked several times, mm -hmm. all right? Cast it away, bitten by a snake, like literally... Stone till he went to what the third heaven and saw things that couldn't even be uttered down on this earth came back down Was sent an agent the Bible says that an agent of Satan a thorn was put on his side right mm -hmm. to keep him humble For some of the revelations and things and mysteries He was he was getting from God which he started to reveal you could see in Thessalonians Remember Paul's the one who tells us that there's actually going to be a taking away Right. Some would call the rapture. Some would call the second coming of Christ. Regardless, we're going to meet the Lord in the air. Amen. That's according to what it says. But he says, behold, a mystery. He gets all of this by what? By having a good, happy life. No, he got it through persecution. He got it through trials. That's why Jesus looked at him and said, I will show you the what great things you must suffer for whose name's sake? Paul's name's sake. No, Jesus's name's sake. Hence, a.k.a. discipleship. And he's an apostle. So he was sent right into the fire so that other people like the Corinthians, like the Galatians, he had to deal with Barnabas. They were both apostles. And a lot of times we talk about Paul a lot, but we don't know that they were both set apart. And we're going to get into that. For those that are faithful, and you guys watching later, you really want to know what this ministry is about? This is about setting everybody biblically in order. This is not about the wickedy, <laughs> whack, the whack, wash, watered down stuff we get right now that certain churches are like, well, and I'm not saying that God can't move through that variety, but I'm saying that biblically, authentically, we want to be as close as possible to what's being repeated, the behaviors we see happening here, regardless, regardless of the culture. We had live a different culture, but the regardless is that. God's word stands throughout time. Amen. Even though we have the technology and we have a different, you know, kind of apparatus, how we how we operate, regardless, this word lasts forever. So I believe that God will give us and has given us a kingdom minded structure and biblical principles. Biblical principles that we can really follow. Amen. Trials. Last time I checked, they didn't change. <laughs> Amen. We still go through something. We just don't go through as much as they went through. They shed their blood. All of them are martyred. I think the only one that didn't, that wasn't killed was who? John, right? No, John was beheaded. No, uh, the apostle John. Yeah, he was, he was, uh, was he um, left on an island? Or he was, uh, he eventually died. They tried boiling him though. And then they threw him on, yeah, they tried boiling him with, uh, with uh, boiling oil, right? Or something like that. But I don't know. I think they were saying he was the one that said, turn up the heat. It's not hot enough for something like that. I don't know. Y'all can check me on that. There was like, there's, there are people that say that, uh, biblical whatevers. But the point is, is that this never goes away because sanctification is for the process of all believers. We cannot be justified by our own works. Correct? We got that. Amen. But people think it stops there. It doesn't stop there, guys. We, you have to obey. You have to live this thing out. To show whether or not your faith really is in him, God takes us through a process called sanctification. And this is where people, and I know a lot of people don't believe in this because we're going to get on, we're going to get on the subject of sin and holiness. Not tonight. We're going to dance around it a little bit, but because the Holy Spirit really, truly wants you to live for him. He wants you to live according and do God's will. The Holy Spirit, the Bible says the Holy Spirit searches the deep things of God. Meaning in the things that God is really concerned about, the Holy Spirit will let you know, right? 
it's not so much, uh, you know, I'm not saying that we can't acknowledge God in all of our ways. And he likes to deal with us in those ways. And if you're that personal, he'll do that, you know, because I never knock people like, for example, I ended up getting hit by a car, right? Remember? And then a few, few years ago, and I kept saying, I, I'd be always acting like I, I could just plan out the future. I'm all driving and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to fix this cylinder and I'm going to get this spark plug and then we're going to sell this one and then we're going to get this. And that same exact day, I get in a car accident, like about three hours later. Total. Total. Right. I try. And I was just thinking to myself, like it wasn't it didn't dawn on me until a few days later as I was praying to God about it. I ended up renting things, you know, renting through Enterprise and they were trying to figure out how to fix the car. Ends up, they couldn't fix it, but they said, hey, we'll just cash you out this money. And then I'm thinking, like, I'm trying to fight against this whole thing. Nah, just fix my car because this is my baby and blah, blah, blah. I'm thinking a certain way about it. And then the van goes out. So our minivan goes out. And it's like, read between the lines. Like, I go to the Holy Ghost and start asking questions. It's like, hey, I'm trying to tell you something. I want you to get a new car. I'm trying to help you out. You're not seeing it. You're fighting, trying to keep stuff that I'm trying to say, let go of, right? And this is not prosperity. This is just acknowledging God in all of your ways. You're saying, God, like I was trying to do it my way. And God was like, no, I have a better way. This is the better way. Lose the van. The van is going to go. This money used is the down payment on an SUV. Boom. It worked out. God worked it out. And then I had to go through some other stuff. But regardless, God set it up. And I'm just saying that if you have that type of intimacy with God, that is a place to start where things start to flourish, where you start to hear God and people go, oh, you're doing too much because, you know, you don't need to ask God whether or not you go to, you know, Chick-fil-A or In-N-Out. Like, it's not that deep, right? And it, yeah, but for some people, it's like that. It said acknowledge him in all of your ways, right? Because I've had times where... We was like, y'all was like, I want burritos. And I'm thinking to myself, that does sound good, but no, nah, I don't want to go through all the hassle. We went around, we saw that taco truck. It was like 30 people there. I was like, nah, not today. We ain't doing that. We ain't doing no 30 day, 30 people wait in line kind of stuff just for some burritos that are okay. About an eight, right? Then we went to habit. And what ended up happening? We found that person at peace. The guy literally got prayed for. He got the gospel. Never heard of the gospel. I asked him, have you ever heard of the gospel? Right? I was going to try to hit him up with all that. And you guys already called it out. I'm about to eat this food. And they said, um, so when are you going to talk to that guy? And I'm just looking at it. It's like, can I eat my sandwich? You know? But then I was like, you know what? I got to do this. And Lord set it up. We started talking about other stuff outside. Boom. If I didn't, if you wasn't behind him, he got spooked because he didn't know you were right behind him. But I say, yeah, I have him behind you because you're, gonna, you're about to be laid out in front of this thing. And they're going to try to call the ambulance thinking I hurt you. Right. But the power of the Holy Spirit hit him. And then we started, you know, basically started doing deliverance on him. We just cast that demon out of him or whatever is inside of him. And it was connected to some pain or some like anxiety. Some stuff happened. But he never heard of the gospel, though. That was an opportunity. So he got the full gospel. You know, he wasn't ready to repent. Even after that, though, he was like, whoa. And that's the thing. You can't do nothing about that. It's your job to just say, hey, I'm going to present this information. I'm going to persuade you to come to Christ, but I'm going to tell you. I told him, I said, when are you thinking about repenting? Because that's the first step. You need to repent, put your faith and trust in Christ. I said, before, I told him, before you get baptized in the water, before you even get filled with the Holy Ghost, before we do all of that, right? I can't force you for something that God is requiring out of you. That can't happen. You can't, you know, like I said, force love is not real love. I can't put somebody in a headlock because you're going to be... You know, <laughs> try to put them in a full Nelson and said, go to Christ now. Right. That ain't going to happen. You can't body slam somebody into Jesus. OK, you could you could drop kick some people. I've seen people get drop kicked in deliverance. But that's that's a, that's that's in Africa. Only in Africa. Only now. Nah. <laughs> um, but no, seriously, like that moment is the moment where we have to understand someone's watering someone's planting at that moment you're planting he said i never heard of the gospel before but if i wasn't acknowledging god in all of my ways you wouldn't be at the habit correct because i first was like where do we go and god's like let's go to habit but i didn't think much of it just go to habit oh okay and so it's okay that's the way god wants us to live by the spirit amen 
That's, that's, that's what he's saying. Amen, 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 amen. Everybody say amen. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right. So I'll fast forward this real quick. Sanctification is a process in which all throughout your life, God is setting you apart for his use. But you have to yield, keyword, yield to the Holy Spirit. You can't tell the Holy Spirit what to do. You have to yield to it. He's helping you on what we call the great what? Great co-mission. Amen? Meaning in you are not alone on this mission. That's why he said, I'm going to send a helper to you. That's what John 14 says. Okay? So some of this stuff is redundant for some of y'all. I'm trying to clarify that this is how we pull all into discipleship. We're not just saying, hey, just follow the Gospels. Just follow Luke 10. Just cast out demons. Just preach the gospel. Just heal the sick. Just do everything Jesus did. Yes and no, in a sense. <laughs> because Jesus set the church in order. And the order of the church has apostles, teachers, prophets in a specific order. It says apostles first, prophets, then teachers, then not even pastors or evangelists. You know what it says? It says miracles. Then it says healing. Then it talks about administration and all these other things. But it doesn't say the same thing in Ephesians 4, 11. Ephesians 4, 11 says God has given to the church apostles, teachers, preach, uh, pastors, or shepherds to be exact. And uh, these giftings, uh, prophets, and evangelists. And those all are a variety of functions. And we'll talk about them later because they're really presented like offices, right? And the reality is they're more like functions. Amen? Because I know, and I'm not trying to get into this hierarchy thing because people get kind of weird about stuff like that too. But when it comes to the body of Christ, I'll talk about this another day, but <laughs> maybe I'll just expound on it just a little bit. We get very, especially charismatic circles, we get very, very sensitive about titles, right? Like, legitimately, I, I, for, for the sake of this ministry, for this dispensation, I'm operating as a pastor, okay? As a, as a shepherd, that's the gifting, okay? To feed God's uh, uh, lambs, to feed his people, right? To protect, amen? Spiritually, the whole nine. But... As an office, legitimately, I'm what they called an elder. In fact, I've laid my, I've had laid, uh, my hands laid on several times from the bishop, just as the same apostles did with the other disciples and the other apostles and the other teachers and the other evangelists and the other elders, just as Peter was an elder. Before God, I'm not talking about a little fancy piece of paper that you register with the state of California. I'm talking something that happened before God. And so when we understand that order, God sets a certain order. So elder is the correct term. That word, that word actually means episcopos. Okay. Now, no one's going to be episcopos Jones, right? No, nah, that's not going to happen. Right. That's just like weird. We don't even talk like that. Right. But the legitimacy is that according to the Bible, there were there was a certain order when it came to their leadership, when it came to the people there. And there was a constant um, submission and surrendering to that. So, but it was always a discipleship with it. There was always discipleship integrated. No one ever lost their concept of we're all servants of Christ. That was never lost. In fact, it seemed as if the apostles weren't really glorified like people make it seem like something to be today. Because the reality was they were called prisoners of the Lord Jesus Christ, servants of the most high God. That's the reality. Remember, the, you know how the kingdom works? And this is what really kills people. And I know today a lot of people in authority and power and uh, have affluence in the body of Christ. They hate this. They know this scripture to be true. The Bible says that in the kingdom, there's what? There's a greater and there's also a what? A least. 
Do you guys know that in the kingdom? So there's a greater and there's the least. But do you know in the kingdom, the greater is the one that does what? Is the best servant. That's greatness in the kingdom. The Bible says the one that serves the most here is the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus was the greatest servant. See, it's a flip on how we see things because we're always thinking the leader, the leader, the leader. But if you really look at the leadership when it comes to the kingdom, when it comes to Paul, Paul went through so much for the benefit of the Philippian church, the, the Corinthian church, the Galatian church, all of them. So if there's somebody that's giving you the word of God or operating and you're like, oh, this man, I got this, this man, I got that. They should be serving. They should be. That's why the Bible says to count double honor to an elder, an ordained elder, someone that has been passed down and set apart for the ministry. And so our trajectory, at least when it comes to how we deal with stuff, is discipleship, following Christ, is everyone. Correct? But some of us, some of us will eventually, you're going to eventually grow in gifts, which is, we're talking about gifts of the Holy Spirit. We talked about gifts of what? Or excuse me, we talked about also you should be bearing fruits of the Holy Spirit. But then some of us will start to find out what is our function or functions in the body of Christ. Okay? And that, when I mean by functions of the body of Christ, I'm saying everyone in here, you cannot, this, there's no way, it's, it's like this. There's no way to turn over God's word. It always means this, amen? If Ephesians 4, 11 says that God has given the entire church, the entire body of Christ, evangelists, it said some apostles, some teachers, some pastors, some uh, prophets, and, uh, and, and, and some shepherds, what it's saying is everybody has something in that. They may operate in a few functions. They may operate in one. But you can't say no one doesn't at all. That they're just straight up, I, I come in here and I don't know anything. I'm just going to be just, you know, just standing here just like an object. It's like, no, you have things in you. That's a guarantee. Are we supposed to wait for those things to be unlocked when he comes back? No. He's saying now. That's why he said the kingdom of God is at hand now. Because now his kingdom is operating through every born again believer. And now we're operating in our true identity. Amen. And so now we're operating as the extension. Like when I talked about the body, me and the bishop were talking about this. About, you know what the, uh, obviously you know what the lungs are, but you know what the pituitary gland is, right? It's like, what is it, at the base of the skull, I believe? Yeah, that's the function, right? That's the function of the body that helps, I think, growth and development, right? Okay, so growth and development. And all of a sudden, we got the lungs, of course. Are either of those what's equally less important? <laughs> They're both needed, right? It's a function for the body. This one goes out, all the cells, nothing's getting produced, nothing's developing. This one goes out, instant shutdown, right? But they're both important to that body, even if one is obvious and one is not as obvious. All right, I'm preaching to somebody now. Come on, I'm preaching. I'm preaching. Somebody's going to catch it in the Holy Ghost. Even though the stuff, we may be looking like, oh, look at that man of God. Look at that woman of God. She's way up there. Blah, 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 blah. All right. But I'm going to keep it real. There's some people I know. I, I shared that with Brianna. I said, there's some people Sister Brianna can reach in the body I can't get to. I can't. It just ain't going to happen. 
God made it that way. There's this constant dependency on each other that God's like, hey, no, Christ is the head. Everybody else is extension of this whole body. And so we operate in that mode and in his authority, but we're all in dependency on one another. Amen. Is that making sense? Is this good stuff? Is this like, OK, I'm catching something now because true sanctification and being led by the spirit, you're going to lead up to recognizing that, oh, I can't do this alone. I can't be, you know, basement dwelling Christian. <laughs> I can't be, you know, in a situation where I don't have some type of uh, fellowship and congregation and really community. But it needs to start with discipleship. So there's got to be some type of, you know, passing down. And, and so Paul, OK, Paul, it, we believe it or not, people think Paul was just, you know, he just dealt with Jesus. He went to Arabia for 14 years. You know, the Holy Spirit taught him stuff. Amen. That's what happened. But do you know, Paul went on his uh, his journey of sharing the faith and starting churches up. But he went to Antioch Church and, you know, the Antioch Church was actually under the authority of the Jerusalem church that was started by who? The Apostle Peter. And so when word got around that the same guy that was killing all the Christians became the guy that ended up being on fire, you know, and preaching the gospel and everything else and being an advocate for the kingdom of God, they were like, okay, we're going to eventually run around and meet this guy. But it was years later. And he spent two weeks with Peter and basically they, they came up to the notion of he said, look, I want to make sure what I'm teaching these people, the Gentiles, is correct. Then they saw it and they said, we have no issue with it. He met with I don't know if you guys know. He didn't just meet with the apostles. He met with the elders of the church. And I know elders because we're thinking like old people, old people. That's what we think, you know, because even for me, for the longest, I had to get over that elder stuff. Right. Because I was like. Okay, elder in a church means something then like what we look at vocab, right? Like elder and bishop basically mean the same thing, okay? It's episcopos and presbyter. They're just overseers. They just oversee the congregation. They're there that they must protect the flock. They must not lord over the sheep, and they must uh, be willing to teach. They have to be. So they have to even have functions in the body of teaching, and I'm going to be honest with you. I know, and I don't want to get back so many people, but I know when someone's operating out of their function. When I go, ooh, you got, you got a preacher, but he can't teach a lick. He doesn't need to be up there, right? You get, you get, they, we even have YouTube personalities that are like, man, that guy is like this. But I'd be like, mm, don't be teaching though. <laughs> because his, his, his gifting is not there, right? But some people are like, you can't tell him to do that. Well, I mean, the word of God says it, though. The word of God says that there's going to be some type of order. God is not the author of confusion. Amen. And so to bring this up, Paul had a situation where he was going to that church and saying, look, I made all these efforts. We started these congregations. Now what? And they said, hey, everything is good that we see here. He checked in with them. He checked in. There was some type of submission there. In fact, most people, glor they glorify Paul, but not realize it was Paul and Barnabas that started these congregations. We just forget about Barnabas. But Barnabas was an apostle too. Wait a second. I thought there were only the apostles. There are other apostles. Apostles exist today. There are still prophets. There are still evangelists. This, you know what we think right now? We just think it's just pastors and evangelists. That's it. And the truth be told, most apostles, the gifting of apostle is someone that goes out, plants, mission, builds things up, moves on, appoints the rest. Exactly what Paul did. Exactly what Barnabas did. Exactly what Philemon did. Co-workers of Paul. And you know what they did? Before they even set them out for their missionary, for their journey, you know what happened? They met up with the other elders. In fact, they met up with other teachers and prophets, a.k.a. the governing order of the church, and that God that Christ established and passed down. But you're going to lose all that. I'm going to keep it real. The church is losing that because we're dissecting only parts of the words of Jesus and not what he said, carry on. 
We know all the Bible stories. We know about the walking on the water. We know he told the, the, the wind to be still. We know all that. We know about him healing the lepers, the, all that. Everybody got that. But how many of us really know what happened in Acts? How many of us really understand how things flow from Acts and how you can demonstrate? You see the power. You see signs, miracles, and wonders. You see the gospel being preached. You see repentance. You see baptism into Christ. You see all these things in the book of Acts. And you see it amplified within the church, within the epistles, these letters. You can see that these people were not unbelievers. They were born again. And Corinthians has the longest letters. Why? You know that there was three trips? Because in the second Corinthians, he says, this is my third time I visit you guys. And you can tell in the writings, that letter uh, that Paul's writing, he's upset. He's hot. He's like, I'm paraphrasing, but he's like, quit acting up. Like, if you really read between the lines, he's saying that the whole time. You guys are acting like straight fools. And he even writes in and says, when I meet with you guys, he said, he said, I, 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 I'm going to act like I'm not that upset. He said, but just trust me in my tone. You're like, like, it's almost like when my, um, my parents and my auntie, she used to always say, you're working my last nerves. You're working my last nerves right now. Like you're getting me there. Paul was like, you're getting me there now. Like, I've been trying to help you guys get this right, but they're still born again. They're still filled with the spirit, right? But he said they're carnal. They're adopting worldly principles and trying to integrate it within this kingdom family mindset. And he's like, no, you got to separate that. He said, don't you guys know? Like, he has to break down. So when he's writing these things, I always tell people, look for that thread of cohesiveness throughout the scripture. Do not drop it in some like, oh, I, there, it, doesn't, it doesn't support the next thing that's being said over here. Everything is, is usually another thing that's being said. All right. So there is some type of submission. Right? Uh, amen. So you get discipled. So I don't want anybody coming in here thinking like, like we, because we, there's a lot of discipleship movements out there. I'm going to be honest with you. There are some people that do stuff similar, but the biggest difference is we don't throw out the order of the church and the order of the gifts of the spirit. We're not like saying like, oh, it didn't really mean that. Or like in Ephesians or excuse me, Hebrews six, which you guys will go over later tonight, I recommend, which and we're going to go over in detail another day. But that's the foundationary teachings of Christ, not even like the other stuff. That's the foundation. Right. Repentance of sins, faith and trust in Christ and obedience baptisms, water baptisms, right? It says uh, laying on the hands. What's the laying on the hands, guys? Depending on what backgrounds and denominations you come from, people don't even know what that means. What's laying on the hands? We just think it's just a funny thing. You see people see when they come down the aisles, it's like, I touched thee. Oh, you know, and they just come out rolling backwards. No, no, no. Laying on the hands is when they're when the presbyter or the elders, the Bible says that the elders of the church laid hands on Timothy. And Paul was writing about that. He says, hey, remember the gift that was imparted into you, that was stirred up inside of you. When the elders of the church, and then he mentions in another passage, when I laid my hands upon you. In fact, even Stephen and the seven other men full of the Holy Ghost had their hands laid on their heads by the apostles. Now, people get into this like old transference of stuff. Listen, it's 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 something that obviously was taught by Christ to the disciples, to the apostles, and they carried on. But when we go, oh, but I don't see it explicitly in the Gospels. So because it's not explicitly, because it's not directly being said by the words of Jesus, people go, oh, I don't, I don't, you know, I remember this one guy, and you know what I'm talking about. I was like, he said, I'll, I'll rather listen to the words of Jesus any day before Paul. And I just looked at him like, you fool. Because I was like, and Lord, forgive me, I don't want to call him fool, but my mind, I, the Lord was like, he 
is so stuck on as if Jesus was going to be in contradiction to what Paul was saying. Remember, Paul was the one telling them, you guys are carnal Christians. He says, Christ is not divided. He said, you're trying to follow me and then you want to follow Apollos. He's like, Christ is not divided. He said, we're really nothing. We're just servants. He said, we're all servants to Christ. So he had to get the perspective shifted. He was like, I was here to plant. Apollos was here to actually help you guys grow or help you get water. He said, but God was the one increasing your guys' faith, increasing your development. We're just literally servants being obedient, right, to Christ. And when we have that mindset, when we have that mindset, then we're able to really follow and function after the Spirit. So the reason why I'm mentioning this is because as a church, we need to understand all these elements of the foundations of, of Christ. And discipleship was a major one. But I don't want us thinking like, oh, just we just gung slinging demons all day. <laughs> right. No, we do that. Right. We come against the kingdom of darkness. But it, like I was telling another brother earlier, I was saying we emphasize deeper deliverance. But, you know, it's greater than deeper deliverance. Deeper relationship with Christ. That's the greatest. And the Bible says that before you're trying to seek all these gifts. He said, Paul said, let what? Love be the highest goal. Let that be the highest goal. Not the lowest goal, the highest goal. Meaning that's the forefront of why we're trying to pray in tongues. Because we're trying to get edified so we can help minister to people properly. Amen? So we can get the fog of this world out of our minds and really constantly be led by the Spirit. We're prophesying to each other because we really care for one another and we want to edify. We're not just trying to look good in front of a camera or trying to tell us, are oh, you going to work and you walk in your destiny, sister? You know, come up and I already saw the number seven, seven, eight, whatever. Like, <laughs> like, come on, man. Like, we need to really get this stuff into the place of love and a place of order of God. Amen. All right. So I know I kind of went a little over the place for a second. Um, but the greater in the kingdom is the one that serves. We're all a part of this body. Amen. And you, every single person in here has different functions from the spirit of God. Amen. You have different functions as part of the church. Now that sanctification eventually leads to what? Glorification. Oh yeah. Thank you. Sorry. That's what happens when you fast too much. Sorry. <laughs> When I fast, oh my gosh. No, I fast a lot. Praise God, I got through the whatever 22 some days, water fast. It's been a challenge, but that's another part of it too. Prayer and, and fasting needs to be a priority. It was for Jesus and it has to be for us too. All right? Uh, and all the disciples. So the real thing about what we're trying to mention here is we're, it's a passing down. Christ said, carry on to the apostles and they carried this thing on. There was a disconnect though, because when we see today's church overall, it ain't being carried on. Now, a few are still doing this, but majority we know this is not happening, right? It's kind of like this. There's a guy named, um, he had a big church. What's his name? The Asian dude. Francis Chan. Okay, Francis Chan. Perfect example. He was a part of church that started getting like real kind of funny style. He said that they were serving the church and then one people were siding with the elders and other people were siding with the senior pastor and it got all discombobulated. He's just like, okay, I'm done with this nonsense, right? So he ended up starting a church in his congregate, in, in his own what? Living room, right? That little living room church <laughs> ended up obviously becoming bigger, right? And it became a situation where eventually they went to what? Big thing. They ended up having 5,000 people attend. Okay? In Southern California, in the Simi Valley. All right? This was years back. This is like probably when I started coming into the faith, somewhere in the 2000s. And he was a pastor over 5,000 people. Multiple services. Coming from his little family in a living room, and grew there just a, in, in the span of just a few years, boom, they're there, right? 
Everybody's like, hey, that's success. But check this out. This is what he says after being the dude, being the dude every Sunday that everybody had to hear. Right? He starts reading the word. And this is, you can look him up. But he says, he starts looking at the crowd of these 5,000 people. And he goes, why am I that important every Sunday to give them something? And he started catching this revelation that a lot of us, especially those that have an apostolic gifting, recognize about the body of Christ. We don't see members. You understand? We see laborers. We see servants. We see people that have giftings. Most pastors would be like, yay, hippery, hooray, I got 5,000 members. Like, yes, jackpot. Because all they have to do is keep this thing going. Keep this thing, keep this, keep this cycle going. Amen? Right? That's, that's all it is. Turn them and burn them. But how does the 5,000 really convert to disciples? How do you even know that? Because the structure, the order is already set up for, you know, he called it pastoral malpractice. Oh my goodness. Compared to what an elder was supposed to do over a congregation. The Bible says that we're, we're supposed to not lord the people. So meaning in we recognize every single person here, anybody that's a part, I, myself, we all have a chief shepherd and his name is Jesus Christ, King Jesus. Amen. That's our chief shepherd. All God does is he sets people up based on their spiritual maturity at that time in their lives where I was a person before I was saying this to y'all. I was sitting down over there. You understand? Hearing somebody else speak the word and then ended up actually becoming discipled by another man of God. Going from a minister or pre-minister to a minister to to a uh, uh, to a um, pr pr uh, what do you call pra practicing elder to an official elder, right? Then growing from that and and overseeing different congregations and doing so. There was a discipleship and a surrendering, just like Paul did with Timothy, just like Paul did with Titus. Amen. And so this 5,000, you know what he goes? He looks at all these people and he says, there has to be something that is important about them, a part of the body of Christ. I can't neglect that. And you know what he did? He shut the whole thing down. And people were like, he lost his mind. And you know what he started doing? He started doing a situation where he said, what if instead of, you know, I talked to other men of God like this, but it's like, Instead of having, you know, I guess I'll just put this like an oak tree, right? You guys know how big an oak tree? Huge, right? But he's saying that, like, what if you had, I don't know, more fields, fields of plants all over the place, right? Remember the kingdom of God said it's just a little mustard seed that can grow a whole, like, vineyard out, right? And... He started really rehashing this whole concept of church and this whole, let's do everything mega, mega, mega. But what if we had a variety, a variety of what? A variety of locations where people were able to have everything like the early Acts church had and still were connected, right? But they had literally, it's in a sense, like a discipleship network. Some people have that stuff there. But this has to be orchestrated in such a way where everything has to flow according to the biblical structure of the church. Because if it doesn't, it will turn into a hot mess. <laughs> and most pastors, this is like, ah, suicide, eject, eject abort, right? Because in their minds... You can't regulate all that. There has to be a trust in the system of the functions of the body. An apostle was like, yes, that's all we do. 
We, I mean, if you think about it, right before uh, Paul's death, he tells Titus, hey, there are several congregations we started. I'm going to send you, Titus, to carry out my work, basically still operate as the next apostle in line, but ordain elders in each city. What he means by that is appoint men of the faith with these categories, right, which you'll see in Timothy, and place them over these congregations. And these elders served as pastors. They weren't even called shepherds. They were called elders. They were just overseers, right? But they had the ability to teach. They had the ability to shepherd. Amen? They couldn't be crazy dudes just slapping everybody upside the head saying, you're going to do this, you're going to do that, you know? They had to have a certain like character. They had to be able to rule their house properly, the whole nine. So these are the things that this ministry, we still follow that. There's not like a, oh, you need four, eight years of cemetery, <laughs> seminary <laughs> to be able to do this. No, that's not, that's not biblical. I remember the first time, and if, if that man of God watches later, because <laughs> I have met a friend of mine, and I love y'all out there, y'all with the, with the seminary um, degrees and everything else. But I remember years ago when I was ordained as a minister, and we went through a different t training, but we, weren't, we didn't have to go through typical seminary and everything else, four years or two and a half years or whatever, right? And this guy was upset about that, a friend of mine. And then I finally just unleashed on him in the spirit. I said, did Paul have a degree in this? Now, I know people can say, well, they were Jewish. And so Jewish people at age 13, they had been discipled from 13 all the way 30. Yes, you're correct. And they had a teacher. His teacher was Gamaliel. So he did know the scriptures very well. It's probably beyond like PhD status, right? But, the, but to be a servant of God, Philip and the evangelist and Stephen who got stoned literally right before the church got persecuted, none of them had degrees. They weren't completely uneducated in the sense of religion, right? In the sense of the Jewish customs, because the entire Jewish culture was 13 and up. You're a disciple. You know what I mean? Someone's going to teach you something. You know, that was a part. It was ingrained in the culture. But to say that they needed a degree to do the work of the Lord, that's just wrong. That's not biblical. So there's a lot of things that humans, we what? We extrapolate and we put on these church systems because, you know, we just basically don't want no cult leaders coming out of these things. But the reality is, is that it's just more systems to really quench what I call the Holy Spirit. You're quenching the Holy Spirit. You're basically saying, I know better than the Holy Spirit. When all Jesus said was in Acts 1, 8, that when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will receive what? Power. Dunamis power. To do what? To be a witness throughout the world, to tell everyone about me. That's all what it takes, honestly. As you grow in your gifts, though, we submit to someone. Someone helps you. You know, if you enter into ministry, most likely hands are going to be laid upon you to set you apart, you know, because there's differences. But in this ministry, we try to make sure that it's not so, not saying black and white, but it's that you know the difference. That everyone at the, at the core of their selves are always disciples. Amen? That that never changes. That, oh, if I got ordained, now all of a sudden I have to talk like this when I go to work. And, you know, hey, I'm an ordained minister. You got to shake my hand properly. You know? You can't disrespect me because I'm more... Nah. And then, you're, then, you're, then you lost it. <laughs> then you're... That's, in fact... That's why the Bible says you cannot even appoint a leader over the church if they're young in their faith. If they're, it's not just a young person. They're talking about young in their faith. If they're not even mature, period, spiritually. Because a novice, that person has not really went through anything. They'll get blasted by Satan in two seconds. Satan looks like, oh, new target, new target. Come on, guys, let's get this guy. See, see how he can last. I've seen many preachers. We know many preachers that have fell because they what? They jumped out too quick. I'll tell you to the point where they serve in time. That's what I'm trying to say. As I was saying, Satan loves to pick preachers off. He loves to pick men of God off. How many scandals you see? 
with men of God. A lot. Correct? It don't matter if it's the, the big, big, big mega stuff or the small stuff. You see preachers in New York. What's that little crazy dude? Yeah, he got his chains robbed and then he ended up slapping someone. <laughs> Just nonsense that's out there. Right? Because people think of themselves too high. Then they ought to think, as Romans 12 says. But if we're really following this word, we serve one another in love. Amen? That's, that's the important part. All right, we're getting, we're getting close to, to where we're going to go. So I'm giving, like, I'm giving like little condensed versions of some of the stuff we talked about and some of the stuff we are going to talk about. But the three types of salvation, you go through this process. You get developed. Now, glorification, when we see Jesus, okay? When Jesus comes back, the Bible says that we're going to be glorified. We're going to inherit the glory that was entrusted. That's, that's blessed to those that are the, um, the heirs of God. You guys don't mind closing that? I don't, I don't know why it was locking. Okay, we'll talk, we'll talk to him next time about that. Yeah, we'll talk to him about that. So glorification is what? When we get the glory. And it's not saying that, and this is what's hard for people to admit, because we'll go through some scripture in a second real quick. Actually, we're going to go to two scriptures, Galatians 6 and Romans 8. So if you guys need to find your time to go to that, we're going to go to it real quick. A lot of stuff we, I, I, I just kind of went over, but um, primarily it was just really just living by the Spirit. Primarily, it's living by the Spirit. What does that look like? Galatians 6 is being fruitful in the Spirit. Galatians 5 and 6. But we're going to get to that place of glorification. Okay? That is, that is the ultimate goal. This is the well done, good and faithful servant. Okay? Right? Did you, did you all hear that? That key? Did you hear those two concepts I just said? Well done, good and what? Good and faithful servant. You know, Jesus is going to be telling some people wicked and evil servant. Now, that's a scary passage. That's the passage that pastors don't want to talk about. That's the passage that most real men and women of God rarely even cover. We don't cover Hebrews 6 because Hebrews 6 talks about a scary, scary situation. Just like Galatians 5 says it. I think 1 Corinthians uh, 8 through 10 talks about this, but it talks about a person that continually they've tasted the Holy Spirit. They were born again, but for some reason they kept chasing the sinful nature and they kept practicing sin. And Paul warned the Galatians, because we're going to go there. In fact, go find it real quick for me, Mabel. Galatians 5. No, go to Galatians 5 and see what he said about this. I taught about this a couple weeks ago, so you guys will catch it on YouTube for some that already did this. But I want us to just open this up just for a second, because this, this lines up a lot with, with, uh, with the sanctification process. Five and it should be at the very end when it talks about, um, are you guys in NLT, by the way? I don't know if you guys are in NLT. Galatians 5, 22 through 23 that's the fruits of the Spirit, right? But one thing you'll know about reading the Scriptures is that there's always a... Paul is always contrasting things. You'll see him. He always balances things out for people to see. So when he writes Galatians 5, he's basically saying, your true freedom is in Christ. You need to know this. He's trying to get them to understand your freedom is in Christ. But you will continue if you start living a way where sin is your master again. It's like you can be like what Hebrews 6 says. He said they get to the point where their minds become reprobate. Their minds, they love their sin so much, right? They made an excuse for sin being in their lives so much that the Bible says that it is impossible for people that willfully sin, that are super in this thing. If people say, oh, they're not in it. You can't say that. You can't say that they're that. Paul was saying that they talk about your faith being shipwrecked. They talk about 
don't fall away. Why mention that stuff if it can't happen to you? And this is where the battle gets between the once always saved people and then the eternal salvation folks and all these people that bring up all these arguments and try to debunk what Paul and what the other preachers, they, they love all the good stuff Paul will say. But when it comes to stuff like this, like Paul saying, brothers and sisters, he never said the world. He said, brothers and sisters, I'm going to go over it for you guys. Y'all going to, y'all going to hear this and go, ah, it says, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's Galatians 5 and 21. This is what he says. He says, I say, let, he says, uh, Galatians 5 and 16 says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit, what? Guide your lives. This is why it's so critical to be led by the Spirit. He says, then you won't be doing what your what? Sinful nature craves. So you have a body that God said, you know what? I'm not going to give you a new body yet. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to conquer this thing. Y'all not catching it yet. If you catch it, you won't even be making the excuses you've been making. Because you recognize it's your body telling you that. And the Holy Spirit can say, shut up. You know, that's like, if you really start tapping the spirit, people be like, how you doing? With? Because I get it. I get it now. It's clicked. Some people I was telling them, I was like, hey, you don't have to sin. They were like, brother, you're, you're crazy. You're telling me I don't have to sin. I said, yes, that's what Jesus said. Jesus broke the power of sin off your life. So now it's not that you're sinless. He's the only one that was sinless. Amen. But you're sin free. You have the freedom now to choose. You don't have to go and live a certain way anymore. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is telling you he leads and guides you to what? All truth. So when you have something telling you, I got to do this. The reality is you don't have to do this. I tell people. I think another man of God spoke about this, but I say, hey, if there's a voice telling you to do something, it's either the voice of the Lord, it's either your voice, or it's the enemy, or the world. It's basically the same thing. And you got to know how to distinguish what that voice is, and the Holy Spirit will help you. But you got to stay in this word. You got to stay in prayer. You got to make a relationship, a deeper relationship with the Holy Spirit, with Christ, the priority. The priority. That's why I don't labor in vain. When I'm giving you guys this word, when the Bible says, count an elder, count an elder, I ain't an old person, but in the Lord, <laughs> that's how God looks at me. Amen. Before heaven. Like, it doesn't matter what little papers we did before. Like, we, we got married. Amen. And the state of California recognized it. I could burn that thing up. Don't matter to me. You want to know why? Because I did it before God. Because I did it before God, that means more than any little funky paper. So when you get ordained before God, it don't make none of that crap, none of the seminary, none of the, any of that stuff does not matter. You did that before God in heaven. That was signed off in the courtroom of heaven. Y'all catch that another day. There is a courtroom of heaven. This stuff is re being recorded. Everything we're saying and doing in our bodies is being recorded. And J Christ said, whether you're in him or whether you're out of him, everyone's going to have to face him. First us believers, then the unbelievers. All right. Now, this is why Paul is trying to give them warning, warning, warning. He says it in Corinthians 2 as well. But I'll just we'll just go over Galatians. He says the Holy Spirit guides your life. This is 16, 5 and 16. You won't be doing what the sinful nature craves. He said the sinful nature wants to do evil which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are what? Opposite of what the sinful nature desires. So the spirit's going to tell you, hey, don't do that. That's why I tell people, any temptation you go through, you always have a way of escape. God guarantees it. It's his guarantee. He's saying it's there. I'm going to provide you a way out. The Holy Spirit's going to tell you, eh, eh, don't do that. Don't watch that. Don't be around this crowd. Don't hear that right now. You understand? You're, 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 it, it may even tell you like, okay, 
You may be on uh, YouTube. I call it the YouTube. What's, what's the term? The YouTube rabbit hole. Like, you start like watching every little short on the planet till you're you seeing like eagles and and uh, egrets and cats doing backflips and all types of stuff. And you're like, man, I just spent watching a hundred different shorts. <laughs> Think about the attention span of society, right? TikTok jacked all that up, right? So we could barely sit down and just really, really eat properly, right? Eat with our, with our minds and, and, and consume information. But here's the thing. Jesus says, or excuse me, Paul is saying, these two forces, your flesh and your spirit, are fighting each other constantly. He says, you're not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed or led by the spirit, you're not under obligation of the law to the law of Moses. Now, the context of this is they were trying to, they were trying to go back to the law. Straight up, these guys were getting forced to circumcise themselves, okay? They were saying, do this, and you're more holy. And the reality was, none of them had to do it. And he was saying, he was getting really ticked off. Paul was like, I wish I was there. He's just like, I'm writing this letter. He said, I wish these same guys telling you would start cutting up their body parts. Because they were trying to say, in order to be closer to God, you guys know you got to cut off this and you got to cut off that and you got to do this. They were trying to put all these mosaic rituals back into the equation. He was just like, dude, we dropped all that. He said, you and I both know it. This is where, the, this is where he confronts Peter a few, uh, um, a few chapters earlier. But this is the real context. It's about living by the spirit and not by the flesh. Now, 19. This is the most important part. It says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, keyword, when you follow, when you become a disciple of your sinful nature, guess what happens? Your results are very clear. Sexual immorality. We all know what that is. Meaning, and God is saying, sexual morality is within the confines of marriage. Amen? And not, yeah, yes, let's be specific. One husband, one wife. Amen? Because people say, oh, that's cool. Let's go have a little shindig. And they got three here, three there, four there. And, you know, there's a whole lot of craziness. People married to llamas and all types of stuff. And I'm just saying that, like, that's how crazy the world is right now. But the reality is, is this. It says sexual morality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, which is stubbornness, by the way. That's why I tell people, you stubborn, even like me, I'll be like, oh, Lord, you got you to get the stubbornness out. Because stubbornness will be like, the Bible says stubbornness is as idolatry because you worship the way you do things, right? And then now you become the God, okay? Now, it says sorcery, that word pharmakia means all types of drugs, anything that intoxicates you, hostility, if you're a hostile person, if you're quarreling, if you're always trying to fight someone, if you're always trying to fight situations, jealousy, we know what that is, outbursts of anger, if you've had moments where you're in rage, I'm going to tell you right now, you, you, you got to get checked up, okay? That's why I always tell people, if, you, if these things, if, it's, if the shoe fits, you know, wear it, God will change the shoe out for you, amen? He's saying selfish ambition, dissension, meaning people that like to create conflict, right? Or cause discord, okay? It says division, envy, drunkenness, Wild parties, wait a second, that's like almost everything the world does. <laughs> this is like literally almost covering everything the entire world does, correct? Mm -hmm. It's all about this. It says, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, so how do you inherit the kingdom of God? Hey, by doing what? Practice? Holiness. Practice, meaning repeatedly practice being set apart for God. That's going to come through prayer, through fasting, through reading his word, through serving in the kingdom, right? Through growing in your gifts, through yielding to other people in the body of Christ. It's, that's how important it is. Peter had to... Peter set apart himself or, uh, or, or Jesus set, set him apart. But eventually Peter was praying on the rooftop, got lost in a trance. The Holy Spirit told him that a man was going to come with some other guys and he was supposed to share the word with them. He comes out of the trance. He doesn't realize that 
the same creatures he saw that, you know, the, the, the spirit of God said, slay and eat. And he looked at those creatures and he said, I'm not supposed to eat these because he's thinking in his Jewish mentality. He's not thinking in his new spirit man mindset, where in the spirit, God cleans all that up. He's saying those type of people, he finds out that represented the Gentiles, the unclean, you know, animals. But if he didn't make holiness and prayer priority, he would have never got that revelation. He got that revelation and he still struggled. Because he had this concept in his mind was like, I got to be like my Jewish brethren. I got to still, we, we can't drop our customs. And Peter, Paul had to call him out and say, I'm a Jew myself, but I know the real deal is that we're all in one new man and we got to get this straight. He said, we got, the, we got to get this straight. We got to stop treating each other like this. And so practicing holiness, practicing righteousness. And as the word says, she mentioned it earlier, crucify the flesh or crucify the deeds of the flesh, that's what we do, all right? And it says, in, in that situation, now you live a what? You live a life where you have fruits, and you guys catch the, the, the fruit message, it'll, it'll clear up all that. But it says, those who belong to Christ have nailed or crucified the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. It says, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in how many parts of our lives? 25, it says what? So in every part of your life, you should be doing what? Every part. Every part of our lives, we should be following the Spirit's leading. Okay? So you shouldn't be a follower or a disciple of the flesh. You should be a disciple of the Spirit. You see how this is growing? How God is starting to really pull this thing out now. Where we're like, oh, I follow Jesus. And Jesus is saying, yeah. And I was being led by the Holy Spirit, by God's Spirit. But I had to leave to send you the Holy Spirit, right? So now you're a part of this family of God that's extending exactly what Christ wanted, exactly what the body of Christ was supposed to do, was be the extension, his family. Now, we'll get, it, we'll get into that. Let's roll on to Romans 8 real fast. In fact, hold on. What's the other part? Were we missing a part? Actually, yeah, we were missing 26. Sorry. 5 and 26, it says, let us not become what? Conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another, right? Because that is what happens. What's the next part? Galatians 6, what does it say? Is it Galatians 6? No, actually, it's not Galatians 6. I'm sorry, guys. It's Romans 8, right? I hope I said Romans 8. I know I'm flying off uh, the what do you call it. Yeah, so Galatians 5, we got that right. Sorry, I think I said Galatians 6 earlier. I really meant Galatians 5. And then we're saying Romans 6, or Romans uh, 8. You guys are there? Romans 8, yeah. Romans 8, NLT. Okay, all right. Here's the word. It says there is what? No. No what? Condemnation. So now, keyword, and by the way, 8 was referring to 7 and to 6, so... If you really want to know the context, Paul was talking about them actually being in Christ. OK, he said they were in Christ through baptism in Romans six. He says the power of sin has been broken over their lives. In Romans seven, a lot of people think that Paul is actually talking about himself like currently he's not. Because I used to use that scripture, too. Well, that's what I'm just going to struggle in sin for what I want to do. I don't do. And then what I do do, I don't do like. Because he sounded like a convoluted just mess, right? But he wasn't. In Romans 6, 7, he was actually basically saying like, I used to be like that. But thanks be to God in Lord Jesus Christ, he broke that part out of me. So now I don't live under the law anymore. He said, I live according to the spirit. And then he goes, so now <laughs> there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Another translation says, now, there's no condemnation for those that do not walk according to the flesh, but live by the spirit. So. It's key to make sure that we don't walk by the flesh, but we live by the spirit. We are discipled. We're following Christ through the Holy Spirit. Amen. That and, and this is where cessationists get it real bad. Cessationists are people that don't believe in the gifts. 
Okay, they're the ones that like they they go nuts. Like they 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 go. They, the mo- this is the moment where they the, I can be all biblical with them, and they'll be like, "Oh man, this guy sounds great. He has all this good teaching." The moment I said the Lord told me this, they're like, "Oh, packing up, we're going," because they don't believe like that. They don't believe that God actually speaks to people like that. They just believe it's just through His Word. That's it. Even though you can see in Acts, you can see Paul was spoken, the Holy Spirit directed them right at that moment and said what? But they said, but you're not Paul. And I'm like, <laughs> we, we, there's, this, there's, this like, there's this glorification of the saints. There's this glorification of all the apostles and everything else. But then we're just like rigmarole in the future. Like we're just like, y'all just fodder. <laughs> you're just like the nobodies. All right, we're getting there. Romans 8 says there's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you. The spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So when I tell somebody, hey, you really don't have to sin anymore. I really mean that, guys. I know people go like, whoa, wait a second. You telling me that you never sin? No, it's not that. There's times where I pray and I go, Lord, if I sin unknowingly or knowingly, I I cover it every day when I pray. Why not? The reality is that he is faithful to forgive. Amen. But he's saying you shouldn't be practicing sin and you shouldn't. And if you're struggling, you can actually be free of it. He's saying you should be a slave to right living. That's what Romans six says. You should be a slave to righteous living, but you cannot live righteously without being led by the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. You are fighting forces that only the Holy Spirit can come against. Amen? That's what's really happening here. I can, I can keep it a buck with you guys. Sometimes on social media, or we already know they're listening to us. Like, it's straight way beyond Big Brother, okay? It's been like that, though. That's the thing what people don't understand. Because it's compounded. There's spiritual things at work. You think they just listen to your conversation through Amazon and Alexa and your phone and all that stuff? Guys, we got a spirit world that already knows they in your dreams, guys. They're communicating with something that may even be connected to you since you were three years old. And they keep wrapping around different parts of your life and bringing those things up. Or, in fact, there may be things that you know, you see and you on the computer and want to know why you just saw that image or why you just saw that little advertisement. Because they was like, it's trying to bait, it's trying to bait, it's trying to hook you. It's like, let's see if they grab it. Let's see if they grab it. Or they try to throw an image in your mind. You know, that's how marketing works, right? They know how the eyes work. You see it three times in your head, dude. So I'm saying that in the spirit, you can't combat that stuff without being in the Holy Spirit. That's why Christians, a lot of people are struggling. One, some of these, some of these Christians ain't really spirit filled. And then some of them, they don't understand how to really navigate uh, living a life for Christ. They've been told it's easy. It's this or there's no practical application, you know, because I don't want people to think that you, know, you guys are so, you know, they, people used to say You're so heavenly minded. There's no earthly good here. It's just like, dude, it's not that. I'm just, I just understand the, I understand there's a parallel now and I understand that I'm at war and in order to fight war, you got to have your sword. You got to have your armor. Amen. You got to be led by the spirit. You got to be connected to headquarters. (laughs) Amen. Like I can't be just roaming out here acting like, you know, the gladiator or whatever. Like I'm just going to just, you know, do my own thing. That's not how it works. So he's saying this, we're going to finish up with the scripture. Uh, Paul is saying in Romans 8, 3, he says, the law of Moses was unable to save you, us, because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son, Jesus, right? in a body like the bodies we sinners have. So human body. And in that body, God declared an end. Hallelujah. To sin's control over us. Are y'all catching this? This is facts. This is truth. That's why I tell people, they're like, oh, I'm struggling with sin. I'm looking at them like, I know, brother, because you just didn't get the truth of what really happened. You've been accepting a lie from the enemy that you're just going to be, like I said, 
And I know people get mad at me, oh, those sinners saved by grace when I say that. But here's the thing. It's because you're identifying still with the old man. And you shouldn't. You should be identifying with the new man. And that's what I tell people. If you're really not born again, make sure you're born again. Some people just think they are. And it's like, no, you're not. Like, make sure biblically you're, 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 you're really in this thing, right? I'm not talking about cultural. I'm not talking about, hey, I was raised in this. Did I? I'm talking about, are you really in a relationship with Christ? Do you want to make sure you have the whole package? All right. So he's saying this. Jesus put a sin to an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Right. He says he did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer keyword who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. That's the catch. It's for the people that follow the spirit. Correct. It says those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those that are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about the things that please the spirit. OK, so let so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. OK, he says, but letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So you want life and peace? Follow the Holy Spirit. Amen. And peace is not. Everything is going right around me. Peace is, I don't care what's going around me. It's not going to rob me of my peace. Y'all catch that? The Bible says the peace of God. Of who? Of me? Of you? No. Of God that surpasses understanding will rule and protect our hearts and minds. That's a peace that only comes from him. It only comes from above. It doesn't matter how life stresses us out. The Holy Spirit, the peace can calm us and can go, you know what? I don't care about the calamity. I'm going to have joy. I'm going to have peace. Right. I'm not going to let the people or the things affect me this way. Right. And I had to learn that through trials. <laughs> I had to learn that through negative upon negative upon negative accounts. I remember that even the day that, that they were the business called me and they were like, Wells Fargo's like, Mr. Jones, we're going to shut down your account at 12 o'clock. And remember, right in the nick of time. Bishop calls, elder, I got the check. I'm like, got the check, meet me and Tracy. I'm like, ah! I'm waiting for months for this check. And it finally went in that bank. And I was able to keep the account that ended up things growing and helping out the ministry and helping out the business and everything flourishing years later. But Satan was trying to take that whole situation. But God came through still in the nick of time. Amen. So that being said. Uh, are we at eight or nine? Where are we at? Because we're about to wrap up. Six. So, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting your spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. Wait a second. Hold the phone. So you're telling me the flesh I'm living in is always at war with God? Yep. And some people be like, well, God, just then why don't you just take away our flesh? Because he knows the spirit in you is enough. He's preparing you for a new body, but he wants you to get perfected while you're in a body that says constantly the opposite. Man, isn't that interesting? You know, why I believe that I believe because I think I told you guys this. God does not want a speck. An atom of of sin and evil into the next kingdom. He's going to make sure not one iota of it is snuck into that kingdom. So that 100% every part of our bodies were constantly being sanctified, trialed, you know, the whole nine barbecue chicken. <laughs> we're going through it. Being roasted, literally. So that by the time it gets us, boom, we're, we're a bride and we're ready for our glorification. Amen. And then he takes us out of these bodies and puts us into something incorruptible. And he says, hey, they followed with all the temptation. With all, they utilize my grace. They utilize my Holy Spirit. That's what people don't understand. The Spirit of God is a part of God's grace. Remember, He gave it as a gift. The problem is, is like I've said in those other messages, stop throwing God's grace back in His face. That's what many of us Christians are doing. Or so-called believers. And that's why I am trying to help as a, as a man of God, as a teacher of God's Word, I'm trying to help give these truths to everybody saying, hey, don't believe the lies other people are saying. When you start overcoming things and you've already overcame sin, I'm going to keep it real. 
But if you're like, hey, I'm struggling with some things, ask God for wisdom. He's going to show you how to overcome these things. In fact, there's a lot of things between men and women and some of the children that will probably start breaking up and give us practical steps on how to really do this. Because there's things that God has given me practical things to do, like how long you spend on the computer, what things you should be looking at when you're on your cell phone, what software you should have, different things like that. How many people you should communicate. You could, somebody, um, you all don't even know. You go on my tab, my wife be always like, why are you on my password? If you go on my, on my Google, for the last two years, I have over 250 tabs of just the word of God open. I don't close them. I keep them open. I don't press incognito anymore. Okay. <laughs> I tell people, I said, get rid of all your accounts. Stop pressing incognito. That's the first thing. And start making the word of God a priority in your life. Start reading as much word as you can and start making it truth. Know that it's truth and don't accept the lies I don't care what I, I had to literally I had to I'll put it this way now and it will end it at this. Um, the Bible says that there are strongholds, they're mental fortresses. They're really ways of thinking that shape how you do things. I, I, Satan and many people, even some men of God that had watered down teaching. Had told me. That I would always struggle with these particular saints. You always struggle. Man of God, many preachers, you know, struggle. Da, 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 da. And I was like, God, don't you just purge things? Like, isn't there a process of sanctification? Why do I always see you people kind of go back to certain things? And the Lord was just letting me know. It says, because they're believing in a lie. They're not believing in the truth of what I actually did on the cross. What happened when they were baptized. What happened when you got filled with the Spirit. What my word really says. And when you understand that who the sun sets free is free indeed. When you get that part of it, then you're like, oh, I can really live for God. Yes, you can. I can really live for Christ. I can actually live and not be a slave to sin. Absolutely. He doesn't say anything if it's not possible. He's not going to put something out there that's not possible. He says you could be a he says you were once a slave to un righteous living. You were once a slave to sin, but Christ breaks these chains off of you and says, now you're a slave to righteousness. You're a slave to right living. And the results of that is eternal life. According to the word of God. And you guys, Marines, check me. It's Rome. It's Roman six. It's right in there. All right. I'll read this and I'll, and I'll, and, I'll, and we'll end it because this is the word of God. And I want you guys to get this nine says you're not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by what? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think I skipped eight and eight says that's why those who are still control of their sinful nature can never please God. So if you if you're always thinking by your sinful nature, you can't please God. Right. It says, but you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the spirit. If you have the spirit of God living in you. Er! <laughs> I love how Paul has to add that if you have the spirit of God living in you. And it says, and remember that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. Woo. Okay. Wait a second. It says, and Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives light, gives you life because you have been made right with God. The spirit of God who raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give you. Life to your mortal bodies by his same spirit living within you. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, you have no what obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. This is what he's saying. You're not. You, there's no obligation. There's no there's no debt that you have to pay with sin. Right. He says, for if you live by its dictates or its principles, you will die. Guarantee. He says, but if through the power of, of the spirit. You put to death the deeds of your sinful nature. So put to death the actions, right? So we know some of those actions today. Okay. We could say uh, this kid's here. Y'all know the M word. <laughs> uh, we know the things that we do in this world. That's just straight up, you know, opposite lusting after the eye, lusting after the flesh, the pride of life. 
God is saying, kill those things. It says, but if through the power of the spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. So hold on. How do you put to death the deeds of the sinful nature? What power are you relying upon? You can't do it in your own power. You got to do it with the power of the spirit. That's why God gave you the Holy Spirit. That's why he said, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. That's why some of those men, even in Acts 8, and please go look that up. In Acts 8, there's Philip, the evangelist. He casts out demons. He heals the sick. He baptizes people in the authority of Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's all it means, right? So now they become born again. He comes out of that water. He's missing something, though. What does he tell them? The report goes out. Hey, all these people are getting healed. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They got filled with the, they, they, uh, they, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They got baptized, but they weren't what? Baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit. The apostles had to come down. They had to lay their hands on them. And it said all of them got filled with the Spirit. It was a separate situation. All right? Then they spoke in tongues or they prophesied. There was always something that happened afterwards. And so the reason why I'm saying that is because Many people are all these different levels and not understanding the full package. And Paul is speaking to people that got the full package. He's saying, hey, they got this. Now, that's why you were given the Holy Spirit was to live what? Holy. Amen. All right. So let's finish this up and be up out of here. Uh, therefore. I'm sorry. It says. Uh, yeah, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature does. It says, if you live by the dictates of the sinful nature, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature. So by the Spirit, you will put to death the deeds of your sinful nature. It says, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Okay. Now, this is where people get hurt because they're like, oh, I thought every single living person on the planet is a child of God. Mm, no. You're made in the image of God, but you're not an actual child of God unless you're what? The Bible says led by the Spirit of God. Okay, if you have the Holy Spirit. It says, so you, are not, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you receive God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father, for his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. Now, did you see that? We are heirs of who? Whose glory? I don't want nobody telling me this again. Because I always talk to people and they'd be like, Ugh, God shares no glory with no one. <laughs> and I'd be like, always extra. And I said, hey, but you know what he does share it with? His children. Amen? He will upon this place. All right. We'll get, we'll get into glorification another day because that's, that's a real awesome topic. Uh, but it says, if we share with his glory, we also must share with his what? This is the most important part. Okay. Sufferings. So if I can wrap this up for everybody and please stand because this is the wrap up. <laughs> this is the wrapping up. A little different than Sunday. <laughs> Amen. Definitely a, lot, a little more technical. Um, if you want to reign with Christ, you got to suffer with him. The Bible says if you suffer with Christ right now on this earth, you're going to reign with him forever. That's what this is about. Truth be told, your sufferings are not even worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be bestowed in our lives. That's what the Bible says. Paul said, the suffering you're going through on this planet, this is what we pray about. And this, is, this kind of sums up everything about glorification and why we go through what we're going through. Hear me in the spirit, because I want to make sure we pray this out properly. The suffering that you go through on this planet is not worthy to be even compared. The eternal weight of glory that's going to be bestowed upon each and every one of us. There's a glory that God has for us that is greater than anything we can acquire on this planet. Anything. And so what Jesus wants us to know today is just very simple. Let's just go through this process of sanctification. Amen. Know that this is justified, but we're moving on to here. Because I could talk about the cross all day with you. We can get to the cross, the cross, the cross. The cross is beautiful. 
right? The cross is nothing to be ashamed about, right? But we got to remind ourselves of the effects of the cross, what really happened, and the truth that we live in. Hey, sweetie. <laughs> um, no questions, right? <laughs> He's like, that's a lot of talking. <laughs> Amen for everybody here. I want to pray um, specifically um, that we walk into this uh, we walk into this process, all right? No, one's, no one has any other prayer requests or anything before we go? You got a prayer requests? Um, for my friend to believe in God. But a friend to believe in God. What's your friend's name? Jax. Jax. Okay, Jax and Reese. We're going to cover them up. Okay, let's look to the Lord. Dear Lord, we just thank you right now for the future glory, for everything you have for us, Lord, in this body and even out of this body, Lord. We thank you right now for your word today. We just ask, Lord Jesus, that we walk in your truth and your and your and your uh, power right now. We just pray for our friends, Lord. Uh, we pray for Jax and uh, and Reese uh, in the name of Jesus that you open their hearts, Lord. You use the uh, Hezekiah, right? Okay, yeah, right, yeah. Um, you use this. Uh, this man of God, growing, growing man of God, um, use his family and every single one of them, Lord, to glorify your name and to bring people into your kingdom, Lord. I just ask right now, Lord Jesus, that everything that was spoken today, Lord, that we walk in truth and not in lies, Lord, that any sins, Lord, that we that have not been revealed in our lives or the things that we may be doing, Lord, that we're even unaware of. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit expose and show right now, Lord. Let us not be a protector of our sins. Let us not be a protector of the evil things. But we ask right now, Lord, that your light open us up, Lord Jesus, that you build us up in truth, that we can live holy and set apart lives, Lord. Give us practical wisdom, practical application, Lord, to be able to apply it in our daily lives, Lord, from how we speak, from how we communicate, from how we operate, Lord. Show us, Lord, how to crucify our flesh, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that if there's any type of demonic influence, Lord, that you reveal it to any of the people, Lord Jesus, that if anything that they've, they've warred or they've struggled with for years, Lord, I pray, Lord, that they seek the, the power of God and they seek the help of God, Lord, because through your stripes, Lord Jesus, they are healed. In the mighty name of Jesus, we ask and pray. We cover all these things in your gracious name. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right.